This episode of The Reality Check is brought to you by HelloFresh. Forget takeout. HelloFresh delivers all the ingredients for delicious, healthy meals anyone can prepare at home in less than 30 minutes. And HelloFresh is giving our Canadian checkers 50% off their first order. Go to HelloFresh.ca and use promo code REALITY50 to get 50% off your first order. That's HelloFresh.ca, promo code REALITY50. This episode of The Reality Check is brought to you by FreshBooks. FreshBooks is a ridiculously easy-to-use cloud accounting software for small business owners that saves you time and gets you paid faster. Now used by over 10 million people worldwide. For your free 30-day trial, go to freshbooks.com slash the reality check and enter reality check in the how did you hear about us section. This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. This is the show recorded on October 10th, 2017, and I am your host, Darren McKee. With me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, Cuboids? Christina Roach. Hello. And producer Pat. Hi, everyone. We have three great segments for you today. Adam and I interview Britt Ray about her book, Rise of the Necrofauna. Then Adam is going to explore Enchroma glasses for colorblindness. But first, Vegas shooting conspiracies with Pat. So I just wanted to cover this really quickly. As no doubt everyone's heard, on October 1st, a gunman opened fire on an outdoor music festival in Las Vegas from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel, killing 58 people. 489 people were injured. As is the case with major tragic events like this, rumors and conspiracies started almost immediately. So I thought it might be useful to cover some of the main ones floating around the internet. Number one, that the Islamic State or that Antifa claimed responsibility for the massacre. Neither of these is true. A propaganda arm of the Islamic State tried to claim responsibility for the attack. However, investigators quickly ruled out their involvement. A Facebook page claiming to be run by Antifa in Australia posted a status blaming the shooting on American Antifa protesters. However, credible news sources and the group itself have stated that the Facebook page is in no way affiliated with Antifa. That's infuriating. Number two, there was a second shooter on the fourth floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel. No, there wasn't. The rumor of a second shooter received so much attention, Las Vegas police addressed it at a news conference on October 3rd. We are aware of the rumors outside of the media and also on social media that there was more than one assailant, said Las Vegas Metropolitan Police's Kevin McMahill. I want to emphasize, and he named the shooter but we won't, is solely responsible for this heinous act. He said that there was no evidence to support the theory of another shooter. Also, there are no smashed windows on the fourth floor, or any other floor for that matter, of the Mandalay Bay Hotel, except for the 32nd floor where the shooter was. Mm -hmm. Number three, the shooter brought 400 pounds of equipment up 32 floors and removed a window that is 800 pounds of hurricane-proof glass, so we couldn't possibly have acted alone. So, we can't confirm that the equipment weighed 400 pounds, but there was a lot of it, and he did bring it up 32 floors. He did so with a luggage cart and at least 10 suitcases over the course of several days using elevators. Wow. Elevator. Yeah, that's this new technology we have now. We don't all take the stairs up casinos. He definitely could have done this alone. We also can't confirm the weight of the window, but it doesn't really matter because we know he smashed the windows out with a hammer. I also heard that he was very careful to uh, make sure that he was doing this in between shifts so it wasn't always the same people working that would notice the same guy bringing in luggage all the time. Yeah, I believe it. So this is a really horrific event, and it's understandable that people are trying to figure out what's happening here, but let's please stick to the facts, folks. Mm -hmm. So one of the other interesting things about this is that uh, when people were searching about the Las Vegas shooter on YouTube, conspiracy theories were ending up on top and in terms of the search results. Mm-hmm. And and YouTube actually went back and changed the algorithm so that that wasn't happening after a bunch of, there was a bit of outcry from the families. Wow, interesting. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, that's, that's very interesting information, Pat. And thanks for trying to provide some clarity in an absurd situation, which doesn't need any more absurdities due to falsities. Mm-hmm.
And now we have the first part of an interesting interview with Britt Ray talking about the rise of necrofauna and de-extinction. Britt Ray is a radio broadcaster and writer and has hosted and produced CBC radio programs. She has a bachelor's in biology and is currently a PhD candidate in science communication with a focus on synthetic biology at the University of Copenhagen. She has written a book called Rise of Necrofauna, The Science, Ethics, and Risks of De-Extinction, and she is here today to talk to us about it. Welcome, Britt. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So let's start with some basics. So we're all on the same page. What are necrofauna and what is de-extinction? Good questions to begin with. Necrofauna is a really puzzling term that gives me a lot of strange sideways looks. It is a made up word, which you might have guessed. But necro, the prefix, just refers to that Latin meaning of dead. And fauna tells us about animals like flora and fauna. So together, necrofauna just means dead animals. And I use it here to refer to extinct animals. And I actually got this word from a futurist named Alex Steffen, who first used it in the context of a discussion that relates to what the book is all about. And that's de-extinction, which is this idea that scientists can now recreate close versions of extinct species. And he was asking, why on earth would we want to do something like that? Would we not just end up making a bunch of charismatic necrofauna? And by that he meant, would we not just pick candidate species that are extinct to try and bring back to life that are charismatic, that are beautiful, that are majestic, cuddly, cute, that, you know, look back at us with a spark of intelligence and somehow make us feel good about resurrecting some form of them, while we would prefer to leave all the less charismatic, dead, extinct species in their graves forever to be forgotten. And that raises an ethical issue off the get-go. How are we going to choose which extinct animals to work on when it comes to de-extinction? And then I've briefly touched on it, but de-extinction is this movement which is now arising in a variety of labs around the world to recreate facsimiles, so close versions of extinct species such as the woolly mammoth or the passenger pigeon, which people are working on, but you can't get an identical version back, so it's not really resurrection. It's about making close versions of extinct species. Well, that's interesting. So why are they trying to get a close version and not, say, the full version or a so-called real version? That's because the identical reconstruction of an extinct species is simply not possible due to a variety of technological and biological barriers, which we can get into if you're interested. But it's not that they are choosing to make proxies or facsimiles rather than the identical things. It's simply that it is not possible to get there. Okay, so what are some of those main scientific challenges? So in order to do de-extinction, there are three main methods that are used. The first is backbreeding, the second is cloning, and the third is gene editing. So to briefly dig into those, backbreeding is pretty low tech. This is the idea that you could actually use artificial selection, similar to how humans have bred dogs from wolves by selecting traits in wolves that they desired and liked and crossing those wolves together over many generations until they arrived at a variety of different dog breeds that we find likable. The idea with backbreeding is that if there's an extinct animal that's obviously no longer here, however, there are a bunch of living descendants of that animal, such as the aurochs, which is the extinct ancestor of all of today's living cattle, then it must be that the genes of that extinct ancestor are scattered across today's living animals. So by going into today's cattle and selecting for the cattle that have the right horn shape or coloration, for example, as the extinct ancestor had, and then crossing them together over many mated generations, you can start to arrive at a type of cow that looks like the extinct cow, which is what's happening in a couple of aurochs backbreeding projects. But that kind of de-extinction is only skin deep. It's not an identical version. Then if we're talking about cloning, A lot of people are familiar with this from that famous adult animal clone that we heard about back in the 90s, Dolly the Sheep. And the way that Dolly was made is the same way that de-extinction by cloning works. And it's with a process called somatic cell nuclear transfer. And all that involves is taking a cell from the animal that you want to clone. In de-extinction, it would be, you know, the last 
living individual of a species, for example, that has already had some of its tissue frozen before it dies, so it's perfectly intact. And then you can yank out the nucleus inside of one of its cells, and that's just the package that contains most of its DNA. And you would insert that nucleus inside the egg cell of a living close relative. So with that fresh cell from the close relative, you could remove its native nucleus and insert the nucleus with most of the DNA of the extinct animal you want to clone. And then you can apply an electroshock that stimulates that cell to start dividing and turn into, you know, a fertilized embryo that starts to divide into what would then become a fetus. And you implant that in a surrogate mother and it can grow into a clone. Now, the issue here is that Animals have DNA, yes, mainly in that nucleus, but also in other organelles that are called mitochondria. They're the powerhouses of the cells, and they sit in the cellular jelly outside of the nucleus, and they don't get transferred with cloning methods. So the mitochondria of the clone that results is actually from that living relative, which is donating the mitochondrial DNA, but Therefore, its mitochondrial genome is different from what the extinct animal had. So you just on ontological grounds can't call it an identical copy. Right. D- despite the fact that the mitochondrial DNA may be different, would that species really um, look any different to us? Uh, or would it really just be sort of on a cellular respiratory level and stuff like that? That's a great question. We believe it would be very, very similar and that the mitochondrial differences in DNA wouldn't be all that significant. So you can presume that it would probably look just like the extinct animal. However, there could be what's called mitonuclear compatibility, where the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear genome are adapted to one another through evolutionary history. So if you switch that around and give it a totally different mitochondrial genome, what are the effects of that going to be? You'd have to see over a long period of time if that causes any kind of failure or, yeah, just difficulty in its ability to live out its role. But that's unknown when it comes to de-extinction because we haven't seen it happen with any animal that was able to live and grow up. The the one time that de-extinction by cloning happened, there was a an animal cloned of the extinct Bucardo, which was also known as the Pyrenean Ibex, which was a type of mountain goat that lived in the Spanish Pyrenean Mountains, but it only lived for 10 minutes. So we never got to study what these effects were. And then piggybacking off the cloning issue is that also when you create this clone, there's no members of the extinct species that it belonged to that could be available as a surrogate mother to gestate that developing clone fetus. And so again, you have to use a close relative, but that could introduce a whole slew of hormonal or microbiotic, you know, environmental factors that the extinct clone never experienced when it was gestating. So again, not identical conditions um, for creating that animal. And then lastly, we've got gene editing. And this is the method that's being used, for example, to recreate a version of the woolly mammoth at Harvard. And here, if you've got the assembled extinct animal's genome, you've been able to pull its DNA out of a bunch of fossilized remains, for example, and then piece it together like a puzzle and use it as something that you can compare to the genome of its closest living relative. In this case, it would be an Asian elephant. Then you can see, ah, where are these genomes similar and where are these genomes different? And where you see that they're different, you understand that there are genetic changes that made the extinct animal unique from the living animal, and then you can use a gene editing tool. A very popular one these days is CRISPR-Cas9. It's a type of naturally occurring system in bacteria that allow it to protect itself against invading viruses. But since 2012, scientists have realized that they can actually program that naturally occurring enzyme system in bacteria and make it cut DNA on demand in any type of cell, whether that be plant or animal or even human. And you can think of these enzymes in the CRISPR-Cas9 system as molecular scissors that go into a genome. For example, the Asian elephant cut out a gene that was Asian elephant specific, and it can actually also insert new genetic material that the woolly mammoth had, for example, that the Asian elephant didn't have. So then one by one, you can start to imbue the living elephant genome with woolly mammoth specific genes until you've reconstructed a close enough version of the woolly mammoth genome to create an animal that you think will look and act like a woolly mammoth. 
in an elephant's embryo and then implant that in a surrogate mother's womb or an artificial womb, grow it into the animal, bada boom, bada bing. But here again, it's hybridization between the living animal and the extinct animal's genes. You're not necessarily making all 1.4 million genetic changes that are thought to be what the difference is between woolly mammoths and Asian elephants. You might just make several hundred. Right. And as I saw in your book that, you know, the womb you mentioned, but even if it was born uh, with a womb, which isn't the case, there's still no say, conspecifics or family of the typical environment that that organism would have experienced. Yeah. So you can't quite get there. But then, uh, so let's say you had an imperfect clone because the uh, womb environment wasn't identical. Well, then you could, you could clone one and put it in that womb and then it might be a little closer. Does that kind of make sense? So you're saying like a create one and then you use the womb of that one that you just created for the next generation. Yeah. So then it's maybe a little closer. Iteratively getting closer to some sort of a similar environment. Yeah. That sounds like an iterative plan that has some logic behind it. Yeah. I've never heard anyone propose that, but that's a really interesting <laughs> idea. We're just groundbreakers of research here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of research, you know, you see these headlines going on. Are there a lot of labs in the world studying this stuff? Is it a big research enterprise or what? It's not a big research enterprise. It's a fairly fringe activity. There are a handful of labs around the world that are working on this. I could probably count them on both hands. However, there are some heavy hitters behind this, and that's what's making people really pay attention and think, oh, this is not just a scattering of bad science projects. This is... Uh, a scattering of good science projects. <laughs> yeah, a movement of people with the know-how and potentially the connections and funding to be able to get this off the ground. But right now, funding is the issue that's holding it back from being a bigger thing. There's not a lot of national science foundations that want to fund this kind of thing. So they rely on donations largely and partnerships with the industrial biotech labs that want to see this kind of project come to life. But it's, for example, with the Woolly Mammoth Project, what they say is holding them back is not the scientific barriers, but having enough private funding in order to really steam ahead. Interesting. Hi all, producer Pat here. We'll get back to the show in a second, but first a few words about our sponsors. We've used HelloFresh a few times now, and it really is pretty cool. A box shows up at your front door with step-by-step -step instructions and exactly the right amount of ingredients. There's no waste, just delicious meals. They do all the planning and shopping, you do the cooking. If you want to give it a try, HelloFresh is giving our Canadian checkers 50% off their first order. Go to hellofresh.ca and use the promo code REALITY50. Hey checkers, if you're a freelancer or small business owner like me, you know how much accounting can suck up valuable time. FreshBooks makes ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software that simplifies things like invoicing, tracking expenses, and receiving payments online. You can even take photos of receipts on your phone using FreshBooks mobile apps to make claiming expenses easier. Right now, you can try a 30-day unrestricted free trial with no credit card required by going to freshbooks.com forward slash reality check and typing reality check in the how did you hear about us section. All right, back to the show. So we've talked a bit about the science and now I feel this might drift into the ethics and the risks. Uh, so if we can turn to that because these ethics and risk, it might go hand in hand. Do you think the reason for lack of funding is people are, we'll say, concerned about some of the implications of this research? And if so, do you know what those might be? Yeah, I think the lack of funding relates to, for example, governments not knowing necessarily that this is happening or believing that it will have a proven beneficial conservation effect and therefore is going to be competitive with budgets that could create renewable energy from synthetic biology created microbes, for example, which are the types of projects that are getting funded in bioengineering space. But yeah, in terms of the ethical issues that relate to this, there are there are many. Um, we've got animal welfare concerns to think about. When cloning has occurred in many instances, we see that it takes many, 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 many attempts to create embryos by the method that I uh, that I outlined earlier, for example, with Dolly the Sheep, it was 277 attempts before we got one Dolly. <laughs> so 277 dead animals and a lot of money. 
or at least 277 failed embryos. Sorry, okay. So they didn't That's all fair. necessarily get implanted into and gestate and actually. Like exactly, exactly. There were still many implantations mm-hmm. and several pregnancies that then failed before they actually created the animal that lived. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's different shades of opportunity for an animal to fail along the way of growing and then getting born. And the same thing happened with the Bucardo when it was cloned, quote unquote, back to life in the early 2000s. There there were over 57 implantations before one clone was actually created after, I think there were seven successful pregnancies that seemed to be ticking along, but then only one actually came to term and then produced a clone that died roughly 10 minutes after because it had a lung deformity and these types of congenital diseases are really common in clones. And so that's just a a, a huge area there. Is it, is it ethical to subject animals to this type of experimentation when we don't even know the effects of having herds or populations or entire species back of these types of recreated close versions of extinct species will do if they get reintroduced into the wild, which is what scientists want them to do and actually i think that would be worth explaining is that a lot of the people who are trying to march ahead here say that they want the effects of de-extinction to be able to create these animals that have important functional roles to play that can help ecosystems that are currently lacking those roles because the species disappeared and so by reintroducing animals that have the traits of extinct species that allow them to carry out those roles, putting them back into the environments where they're no longer there. The thinking is that that could restore some important ecological productivity. And we know we're all in a biodiversity crisis and it's thought to be a type of high tech conservation tool, but it's yet to be seen if actually creating a large amount of a variety of different extinct animals, close versions of them, putting them into the wild could have that effect. And you could see it also as fairly anti-ecological to think that way, because environments have been adapting to the loss of such species since they went extinct. So recreating an animal that could live and act like it could send that ecosystem into some new tertiary state that it never saw in the past, because the ecosystem is not something that's necessarily open for just drag and drop or plug and play bioengineering. You can't necessarily just shift it back in time by reintroducing some kind of animal. You could create something totally novel there. So there's a lot of questions. It it does seem to be the case that unintended consequences prevail in these circumstances, especially with the fragility of ecosystems and all their interrelated variables. I was thinking, yes, if it works, it's great. But if it doesn't, as you said, it could destabilize it more. Alternatively, I assume they might want to have the animal in captivity first to make sure it's safe and actually has a normal functioning, we'll say, physiology. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking how that might be unpleasant for the animal itself, given that more and more people are concerned about animal welfare. Are we just going to sort of create not clones or not de-extinct species, but variants that are very similar just to have them lead a relatively unpleasant life? Right. It's a huge question. I've spoken with many scientists, both on the conservation side and on the ancient DNA side or the bioengineering side, who say, you know, their nightmare scenario for de-extinction would be just creating a bunch of animals that live in captivity and serve as these spectacles that we can pay to go visit in a zoo for our own entertainment or because it sounds amazing and it's somehow inspiring to do something so sci-fi as resurrect something that reminds us of the dead. But, you know, although that is very grim, people working on de-extinction also admit that zoos would have a very important role to play in de-extinction because having these animals in captivity provides us with the opportunity of studying them, understanding what the ramifications of having them in an ecosystem with other types of animals could be. There are plans in place, for example, with the passenger pigeon de-extinction project to do what's called a a soft release. Once they start getting the genetically engineered birds that resemble the extinct passenger pigeon, they want to have flocks of, you know, let's say many thousands of them in a type of aviary that they can watch, monitor, and then see how once they introduce other species like chipmunks, for example, or blue jays or other species that would be in the 
range that the birds would eventually live in, how they all interact, and then open up the canopy and actually fly these flocks of engineered passenger pigeons between different locations where there are different aviaries set up. And you can actually guide and fly pigeons between directed locations, which is quite amazing. We already do that with pigeons that we have around today. So they'd like to do that to see step by step, how are these pigeons really faring? But it requires captive populations. And that just makes sense because you need to understand what the effects are going to be and how it relates to microbes in the environment and pathogens that will be introduced to just because you don't want to create all these animals for them to die a quote unquote second time. And so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, it's a double dip scenario. People who say the extinction requires zoos also don't want to see them stay there for their entire lifetimes. Adam. A friend of mine thought about getting some fancy glasses to address colorblindness. Is this legit? A few weeks ago, a video of a man putting on chroma glasses to see color for the first time went viral. I saw it tweeted by Joe Rogan, I believe. Um, and this seemed like little more than viral marketing, but it made me wonder how such a pair of glasses would work. It didn't add up based on how I thought colorblindness works, so I thought I would look into it to see what's really going on. I've seen several of these videos, Adam. Adam, they're, is this particular video the one of the man standing sort of outside of his door and his his family's filming and everyone's getting very emotional? And that is the that is that particular one I saw. There are a right. lot of nearly identical videos with different right. people. Oh, that one made my heart warm, and you're gonna probably oh. ruin it for me. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen any of these. I feel left out. <laughs> so, so regardless of if they work or not, it seems to me that this was an intentional viral marketing campaign. I'll get into some of the specifics of that. It may or may not be a legit video of a man putting these glasses on for the first time. But to understand if and how these glasses might work, we need to understand how color blindness works. But before we understand how color blindness works, we need to first understand how color vision works. So basically, in your eyes, you have cones and rods. Rods help you see the intensity of the light just black and white type of thing. They work best at night and are more present um, around the outside of the eye, so that affects your peripheral vision. So that's why you don't distinguish as much color in low light situations, and you can actually see less detail near, near the middle of your field of vision when it's darker. Cones are this amazing thing which allow us to see color. Now there are three types of cones, and each different type distinguishes a different wavelength of light. These are colloquially referred to as blue, green, and red cones, but these names are actually inaccurate. They distinguish short, medium, and long wavelengths of light. And these correspond to blue, green, and yellow-green light wavelengths. There's actually a bit of a range, it's not a specific wavelength that they detect, and this can vary from person to person. There's no cone which specifically detects red light, but due to the fact that red light will trigger the yellow-green cones more than the green cones, then the eye and the brain are able to put together an image of what is red. So that's when it all works well. That's when it works properly for a person that sees all colors. There are a number of ways in which a person can be colorblind. Monochromacy is when a person is totally colorblind, seeing only black and white. Their cones are deficient or absent, and these glasses will do nothing for them. Dichromacy is when one of the cones is missing or deficient, leaving only two types of cones remaining. So the eye is only able to differentiate based on two wavelengths of light. What colors they can see depend on what cones are missing or deficient, and what cones are remaining. Again, the glasses won't do anything for this. Now finally, we have anomalous trichromacy, where the person actually has the three cones, and all three cones work, but the wavelengths that they detect are modified, and they usually confuse red and green. So basically, the wavelengths that the green detecting and yellow green detecting cones are sensitive to are too close together. The eye therefore has considerable overlap where most colors will equally activate those two types of cones. The effect is that most red and green shades can't be distinguished, but a bright red or bright green still might be seen by this person. And this is where these glasses come in. So basically, what these enchroma glasses do is that they block a certain range of wavelength of light, which is in the range which commonly overlaps for people with this anomalous trichromacy. 
The red and green wavelengths, which get through the glasses, are those which uniquely activate only the medium, that being green, or the long, yellow-green cones. So the effect is that the person wearing them can now distinguish shades of red and green that they couldn't see before. Sounds great. Let's all cry. But there's a bit of a patch. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, it doesn't work for all types of color blindness. So it's great for those that it works for. Well, kind of great for those that it works for, and there are still some limitations. Since these block out some light, you're sort of wearing sunglasses as the image is darker. Um, this isn't the best thing for wearing indoors or at night, which is likely why all of these viral videos take place outdoors in the middle of a very bright day. Even for those that these seem to work for, some people don't seem to feel the difference is that noticeable, and it can alter how colors look. Depends how much it overlaps. If a person has near 100% overlap, they won't work very well. It really depends on exactly how colorblind they are. Unlike something like corrective eyeglasses, which sharpen otherwise blurred vision, this is helping someone who could already see clearly just a bit differently when it comes to colors. Though they are potentially able to see more colors, there isn't the same function associated with this as, say, corrective lenses offers. And they cost a lot of money. Models run from $400 to $550. So, what about these videos that we've all been seeing a lot of? Many have millions of views, and the first three I saw had people reacting to a number of colored balloons when first putting on their glasses. I was wondering if this is a coincidence that people are always putting on these glasses around a bunch of similar looking balloons. Well, I noticed a similar dot pattern on some of these various balloons, and thanks to the glory of HD video, I was able to make out some writing on one balloon. It <gasps> said, in chroma, on the balloon. Oh. <laughs> so this meant either the videos were fake, or that the glasses somehow came with balloons. And with a bit of research, I found a number of Amazon reviews, there were 78 to pick from, mentioned that color balloons did actually come with these glasses. Maybe it comes with 99 red balloons, <laughs> and that's a way to assess. And then one green one. Maybe try to find it. So it also seems like Enchroma includes inserts in their products encouraging customers to record the reactions, which actually sounds like a really good business idea. But this doesn't mean that these videos aren't fake. One of the videos was made by Viral Hog. So two of the accounts that I saw these videos on didn't have other videos uploaded. They just had users with a few likes and maybe some playlists and those videos. Now, the exact details of Enchroma's involvement in these viral videos isn't something that I know the specific details about, but I'll just say things are a little fishy and there are some red flags, but these may be legitimate videos. It seems like these might be at least a bit staged in that the company is encouraging people to film them that way, but I feel like they likely got more popular than they would have if this had just been a video that someone had uploaded to the internet. But that these viral videos aren't totally genuine doesn't mean the product doesn't do what it says it does. It kind of does, only for some people, maybe not exactly what it looks like. It seems like Enchroma glasses are effective at allowing some colorblind people to see colors they otherwise can't see. Unfortunately, this does not work for all colorblind people, and it's hard to know if it will without buying these very expensive glasses, which themselves have some limitations. If you're one of the 1 in 12 men, or roughly 1 in 200 women who suffer from some kind of colorblindness, I would suggest you do some research to find out if this might benefit you based on your particular type of colorblindness before you make an investment. Interestingly, uh, our son has color blindness, a little um, bit, a yeah. little bit of color blindness, and he is working for a company right now that that sells clothing, and yeah. so people will order shirts of a certain color, and sometimes he'll contact <laughs> us and say, "Is what this is this? is this yellow or, yellow or is it?" <laughs> and so, um, yeah, in, in the hopes of helping him out, I went and, and looked up an app where you can take a picture with your phone. Yeah. And then it will give you a bit more information and it's really calibrated to the different kind of color blindness. So that's kind oh, of that's interesting good. too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's one thing I thought of when I was seeing these glasses, like you could probably put filters on like, uh, you could probably put a video filter, um, either on a monitor or a TV or, or, or just to apply to a video to, to, to have a similar effect mm -hmm. rather than like in one of these videos, the guy was like putting the glasses on and off while he's watching TV. I'm like, well, you could probably do something with that signal, but maybe that's. Maybe that's just more complicated than it needs to be, right? I find it super interesting that you cited the stats as one in 12 men and one in 200 women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so the reason for this is that uh, colorblindness, um, it's a recessive gene on the X chromosome. So if, if uh, a man only has one X chromosome, so if he has that, 
uh, recessive gene, he will be colorblind. A woman needs to have that recessive gene on both of her X chromosomes, which is why it's it's roughly the square. So it says 1 in 12, 1 in 200. It's maybe more like 1 in 12, 1 in 224, but maybe it's really like 11 and a half or something like that. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for joining us once again, listeners. Pat gave us some truths and showed that absurdities are bad enough on their own. We don't need more lies. We had the first part of an interview with Britt Ray. The second part will follow next week. And Adam explored Enchroma color glasses, which might work for some people. Until next time, think better to act better. Peace out, cuboids. Stay classy, not smartassy. Good night, everyone. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. Thank mm-hmm. you.